And I want to give a, a, a hello to all of our other centers. I'm just so proud of everybody. I've gotten tests back from the North Carolina Center and so thankful for you guys. So again, what God's doing is just amazing. I love what Apostle was sharing with you and I think it just ties in. The thing I hope that you've seen that I begin to feel is as Apostles led the way and then I've come back with some kind of leadership, even without consulting with Apostle Mark, there's been this sort of a follow-up and today's no, no, no exception. Uh, getting prepared for the day, I just, there's been, there's been one main character that in, in the scripture, and I hate to say character, but one person in scripture that just his leadership and how he changed the nation has just been, was astronomical, and his name was Moses. And we understand that everything that he went through um, formatively, I mean, if you can imagine real quick, uh, and then we're going to pray, but if you can imagine, I mean, he was adopted. Um, he was withheld from his, his birth family, although his mother was actually his, the one nursing him. Still, he was withheld with them. Uh, he had to grow up with an impediment of speech. Um, he was an Egyptian, but not an Egyptian. So a lot of these things were coming, but the education and the challenges that he had, and you have to understand, one thing I think about, about Moses, too, is if you do any research on um, Egyptian uh, culture, you know that, uh, again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm in no way, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't, tattoos don't bother me. I don't think that's going to ever, I mean, that's just between you and the Lord. I don't care if we've got bodies, you want to art them up, that's between you and Jesus. But you have to understand, for Moses, it wasn't just art. If we think about Moses, Moses would have been tatted because he was an Egyptian. And he would have had tattoos that represented deities that were Egyptian deities. And the thing I want you to understand, too, is why I say that is sometimes we look down at markings that we got when we were where we shouldn't have been. I'm not talking about your cool Jesus tattoos. <laughs> he set me free. That's awesome. But what I'm saying is that there's some of you that may have something that just reminds you of a place you never wanted to go. As a matter of fact, I've got a buddy of mine who's a pastor now who's doing amazing work for Jesus and has for years. But while he was in prison, he was with an Aryan nation group, and he had a swastika over his heart. And then God calls him into ministry. God delivers him from racism and breaks those chains of bondage. How many knows hate is just hate? It's from the pits of hell. It's nothing God ever designed. So he had the emblem of the organization, the Church of God out of Cleveland, that brought him and accepted him as a minister. And he replaced that with a, you know, a big uh, Church of God cross and swoosh. But all I'm saying is that, all I'm saying is this, guys. Is I, it, we all have history and we all have background and we all have challenges. And, you know, the thing is, is stepping out into what God wants you to be is overcoming the fears that was built when you were who you were. And understanding that, again, we always want to distance ourselves from who we were. I want to distance myself from who I was. But sometimes it's those tragedies that I allow the enemy to develop in my life that has brought compassion and passion and determination in who I am now and who God would have me to be. And I love what Mark said. It's so awesome. You have to let go. What I'm hearing over here is I'm hearing you have to let go of your Linus blanket, your comfort zone, to launch out into who, and to be who God wants you to be. Because how many knows when God calls you to something, he doesn't give you the four-year plan with retirement benefit. It's just, it's just go, and I'll be with you. Vince Lombardi said this about uh, leadership. Maybe you don't know who Vince Lombardi is, but Vince Lombardi... Again, in the 60s, it was, uh, was the Green Bay Packer coach. And, and even the uh, NFL, when they win the championship, it's the Vince Lombardi trophy. But he said this about leadership. He said, leaders aren't born, they're made, and they're made out of hard work. And uh, I think that's very applicable even in a spiritual realm. I think that's applicable in where we are today. And uh, it's definitely going to be applicable in where we're going. Amen. So, all right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for these leaders. Thank you for who they are and what they're doing and where they're going. I thank you, God, for the safe trip for our uh, family that came back from Alaska, God. We're thankful for the revival that went on up there, the connection with the amazing church and uh, touching the amazing people, God, that you've called them, God, to be a part of. Lord, we're so thankful for this leadership, and we pray that something that's said today or, or mentioned today will encourage us and let us grow as leaders, because we as leaders, God, are the cap of what we're leading. If we don't grow, what we're leading won't grow. If we are not willing to risk and expand, then God, what we're leading will never 
expand. So, Lord, we're thankful, and we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory, and it's Jesus' name we all say, amen. amen. All right, guys. What I was studying last night, I actually come upon some great material, uh, and it leads through the word of Isaiah dealing with Jesus Christ and his leadership ability. Last week, for those of you that were in Alaska, amen, fishing and all that good stuff, fishing for souls. Now, wait a minute. That's what I'm saying. Come on, that was a good joke, guys. Come on. But anyway, uh, we, we have to realize that we, last week we learned about being a transformational leader. Seeing something in someone else and help them become who God would have them to be. We know there's a leader, if you don't call it out, it's going to stay inside. I know as a dad, that's the thing I have the joy about my three children. I never realized what a dad's voice meant until I, I was one. My wife and I had a, a great, uh, we'll say, uh, uh, um, um, heated fellowship one. <laughs> a great discussion, a fuss, okay? And what it was is I didn't realize it, but when the kids were little, the pressures that I was going through, I would come home and I would be fussy. I mean, really argumentative. The house wouldn't be like I wanted it to be, and somehow I had in my mind I would come home and, you know, everything would be sparkling. The kids would be dressed in their Sunday best. Hello, Father, we're glad we're here, you know. And that was not what happened. You know, dishes in the sink and tripping over clothes and kids going, wow. And, you know, when we homeschooled our kids, so they were at the house all day long. And uh, so I would come in from work, and if you, you know, ministry's messy, right? Ministry's messy. And you need that sanctuary that's not. And I'm coming home, and this is messy, this is messy, so I'm really getting aggravated. And after a few weeks of that, I noticed my kids, man, as soon as I'm driving up and I come in the house, they're in the room. Tanya's maybe doing something, my wife, and then I'm like, what's going on? And my kids and my wife set me down and say, listen, you don't realize this, but this is what we're hearing. And I'm fussing with my wife, that's not how I'm really acting. And then all of a sudden, my kids chime in and say, oh, yeah, Dad, this, you are. And I remember the tears streaming down my face because the thing is, that's not what I wanted to pull out of them. I, I was letting what I was going through and the frustration of where I was more put something in them than take out of them. So how do we relate to that as leaders? Well, as leaders, I know you're going to be frustrated with every, There's going to be times, and Apostle Mark said it so wonderfully, when we even talked about it last week, you're going to stumble. There's going to be times of your life you're not pleased with what you've done, thought, or said. You know, maybe some, some function that you tried to do, some, some, uh, uh, you know, some mission you tried to accomplish did not c complete. And, and now you're going to interest, you know, be very introspective and judge yourself. And, and if you're not careful what you do with that, either you will give it to Christ or you'll implant that in somebody else whether you realize it or not. Your actions and what you say will, will build something, will plant something in somebody else. So after my family and I came through this challenge, that's one thing that really I begin to think about leadership, not only in the church, because there's people in our church that's the same way if I'm not careful. I've just talked with Billy and Susie, uh, and they're fixing to get a divorce, and then all of a sudden... This other person comes into my life, and if they're not careful, they say, Hey, Pastor, I need you to. And before I know it, my face tells the tale. We was in service, Apostle, here a few weeks ago. And one thing that is a pastor, and you understand, you guys as leaders, you want the power and the move of the Holy Spirit in everything you do. You want the Holy Spirit to take control and have authority because it's His church, it's His operation. But as the leader, you also know you've got people that are just like sparklers, man. They're waiting to be lit so they can see themselves shine. So I'm standing here going, okay, Lord, here we go. I don't think my face is showing it, but I have 20 people at church after it's over that says, boy, you are not happy. I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they show me the video, and I'm literally <laughs> like this ogre going, give them the eye, you know? It's just the thing is, is I just realize I'm putting something in that I didn't really intend to put into the situation. So how do we translate that into leadership? Well, first thing I want to share with you, I'm going to share six points with you this morning about leadership, about looking at through Isaiah's prophecy of Jesus 
And then I'm also going, I know this is weird, but I'm going to tie that off too with a little bit of the man I've been studying a little bit, Moses, and how he dealt with a similar situation, okay? So our first area is godly leaders make other leaders. Godly leaders make other leaders. We said this all through Judges. We said this through the empowered leader. If you're enthusiastic about what you're doing, you will lead people to enthusiasm. If you are melancholy, if you don't care, if you're upset that day, if Brandon just said, hey, I need you to do this, and you said, dang it, we did that last week, I don't want to do that anymore, and we huff and we puff, and guess what? We've got some underlings that are looking at you going, well, I will not do it either. But if you come around and you go, well, you know what, hey, may not be what I want to do, but if this is what the, is going to bless the Lord and is going to bless life changers, then let's do it. Come on, guys then you know what? You're going to have guys that are going to sweat it off and go, okay, and they're going to run right in and do it with you. So remember, leaders, godly leaders make other leaders. In verse 1, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, it informs us that the leader would come from the stem of Jesse, from the branches from his root, roots, and will bear fruit. True leaders cultivate uh, leaders because they have an understanding that whatever the task may be, is accomplished through others in the same heart mi and mindset and work ethic, and it churns an organization along. The gospel and the work of the ministry should extend throughout all time, and it takes investing in other potential leaders to transport this effort. What you do and how you treat people matter. So how can we look at this? And, and one thing I wanted to bring about was a Moses perspective. We know that Moses in Exodus chapter 18 has just helped liberate the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. Again here, I mean, could you imagine? I mean, honestly, let, let's put it in perspective, okay? Um, if, if we could put it in perspective, you know, you, you live in your house, everything's great in your home, and then every week I'm the landlord that comes by, and I've increased your, your mortgage every month until it's almost a place you can't even live there. Your kids are hungry, your wife can't go to the beauty parlor anymore, come on now. Or your husband can't. I'm just an equal opportunity. Maybe he gets his toes done. I don't know. <laughs> hey, some of them do now. That's all I'm saying. If you do, don't get sparkles. Anyway, <laughs> if what? Uh, hold on, wait a minute. Okay, we're all right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There you go. He's wearing it today. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. But what, I, what I'm saying is, and then I'm coming to you, and then all of a sudden, you know, well, one thing is I'm working for this company, but I'm really your brother. I was just adopted out. But man, I don't care. You see, but dude, you're my brother. I said, I don't care. I'm working for them. And then all of a sudden, I, you hear I get fired from that job, right? And then I come to you and I go, hey, now I'm your brother. And now I'm hearing from God and we're going to move out of here. That's what Moses has faced. So we know that Moses was going to face those things. He's not good at speaking. Some say he had a, a, a stutter. Um, some say it was many different things. But now he wouldn't even, you know, he wouldn't go out. So he calls his brother Aaron and God allows Aaron to go and let him speak for him. So here they are. They're going out. They've led the people. They've seen the, this amazing time. Now they're in the middle of where uh, Miriam's family is. Jethro, her father-in-law, who is this wonderful priest to God. And all these things are happening. And... Uh, in chapter 18 of Exodus, we find that Moses is just stressed out. He's trying to do absolutely everything himself. He's not letting anybody else do anything because this is his God vision. So Jethro says, wait a minute, instead of everybody standing in line to come and let you judge them and judge their situation, because you have to understand, you did have one that says, oh, you know, we have land and da 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 da, but then there was also the one that says she won't leave me alone, and you know. So anyway, so Jethro says, "Why don't you have these different tribal leaders and let them lead, and only the biggest things comes to you?" Changed everything. What do you think that did for these tribal leaders that had leadership potential in them? It empowered them. Anybody want to speak to that real quick? Because there was a season of your life to whether it was Apostle Mark or Brandon or Andrew or someone saw something in you and gave you that opportunity. And the thing that's so cool about a leader calling leaders out, leadership out of leaders is because 
you know what that does. When someone recognizes leadership in you, even, even when you've gone through some stuff, it really solidifies and helps you know your past is done and now a new chapter of your life has begun. Somebody believes in you. Somebody has saw something in you. And it turns your heart. Amen? So I, all I'm saying is this. As, and godly leaders make other leaders. Don't forget, and I've said this again and again, your job is not just to lead your, your people. When Apostle Mark and, and, and Apostle one l they send folks you out and you're leading your team, it's not just about getting the job done, but there is somebody on your team that should be the next leader. There is somebody with leadership potential. They may be rough around the edges. They may not be here today. I mean, they're not ready for it. I'm not saying they'll go, come on and lead the Bible study. I mean, they're just fresh into the, into the facility. But what I am saying is be looking at more than the outside. Remember what it was for you to be called into leadership and to be looking to invest that into somebody else. Make sense? Amen. Somebody hand this brother a mic. Have we got a double mic or do you want me to run again? There we go. Hey, yeah, I man, I about wore myself out last week. I need a nap. I feel like it was like a time that you have to turn it over to the next one. You know, let the Holy Spirit pick somebody out and turn it over to them. Amen, my brother. Well, I'll tell you, and I'm sure Apostle Mark could tell you, we actually had this conversation, if he recalls, um, a few weeks ago. What it was like when you first started out and if it was to change the toilet paper, you had to change toilet paper. If it was an unclogged toilet, you had, and in all this, you're doing intakes, and when else doing intakes and trying to help people be delivered, but also, you're also the one that, you know, we're out of notebook paper, can you get some more? I mean, what a blessing to be able to say, I don't have to deal with that anymore. Amen? Amen? <laughs> and the thing is, you've got somebody saying, man, I could do this. How did God call you? Somebody speak to that real quick. Um, okay, so I was an intern in the program, and I remember being called into the office and actually to be, um, I don't know the correct words to say, but chastised or corrected. And Miss Mindy literally spoke into my life, and she said, you, she said, you're such a remarkable woman. And you can do so much. And like that stuck with me and brought out, I would have never seen that I would have been an intake or a house mom or anything like that. And it just really meant a lot. So like it can really make a difference with people. Come on. That's what we're talking about. Again, guys, remember, being a good leader is not just about having a, mo as many people as you can follow you. Amen. Come on, that's being a superstar. Justin Bieber shows up in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and he's going to have thousands of people. But that didn't make him a leader. Amen? Leaders build leaders. That's our number one. I believe, in, to be honest with you, yes, getting the job done, but that's got to be one of our top three jobs, looking and building another leader. Amen? All right, number two. Godly leaders understand the importance of faith. You ever, have you ever had that leader that was, got arrogant? They had success and they got arrogant like it was their creativity that brought everything into being. I mean, I mean, you know, it's, and you know they're fixing to fall. You know you can see it. I've been, man, I've been in this thing so long that it just, you see it happen. Well, look what we're doing and we're doing great and we're doing this and look what I did. And I think this and then all of a sudden you're going, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. And then about that time you read it in the newspaper. They took with their secretary and run off because they did, they did, they did. So again, remember, guys, godly leaders understand the importance of faith. Without faith, it's what? Please the Lord. There's my leadership. Isaiah starts with a uh, two off, oh, excuse me, verse two off with, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Great leaders have inner source or the Holy Spirit that drives their skills, abilities, knowledge, and understanding. When these attributes are rooted in self and others, they typically yield disastrous results. However, those attributes rest on the power and the strength of the Lord. Great and mighty things are accomplished for His glory and God's people because He equips us with true wisdom, counsel, and knowledge needed. How many understands that 
our source is not our own ingenuity. Our source is Jesus. And he gives us that sweet Holy Spirit to empower us for service. How many times has the Holy Spirit spoke to you to go left and not right? To stop instead of go. To go instead of stop. Can you give us a for instance, Apostle Mark? Say that, repeat that again for me, Pastor. Okay. Huh? Repeat that again for me. Uh, for instance, on... Right. Said no. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a good one. There's a lot of them, but I want to think of one that's like, well, gosh, number one was like, uh, you know, just going to Teen Challenge. I knew the Holy Spirit was saying go, and I was like, no, no, no. Uh, s s even starting Life Changers as well. There was, you know, I wanted to go, but it was a big step, of, uh, a big step of faith. Uh, then it got to a point where I really didn't want to go because I got comfortable. Uh, but the Holy Spirit was saying, "Nope, you got to go now." Actually, the grace for where I was had lifted, and I knew that if I didn't shift and move, that where I was, I was not going to be sustained anymore. So there's where you got to be careful. You know, if, if you know the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something, you've got to be obedient because the grace for where you're at, you know, it can lift, guys. And, and, and it'll lift and it'll shift. And you've got to follow it. Okay? Follow, flow with it. So how do we, as leaders, how do we ensure that we listen to the Holy Spirit and not to ourselves. Where does that begin? In the prayer closet. My Moses uh, scripture this time comes from Exodus 33, and it's Joshua. I love this about Joshua. Of course, we did re read that Joshua didn't raise a leader. That was the bumbling failure. But we know preparing himself for leadership, he got to know God. If you can imagine, he was, he was Moses' right hand. And when Moses would go in, I love this narrative if you read it there in Exodus 33, is they had a, a tabernacle, a tent. And all of a sudden, Moses would know, it would, the, the, the cloud would, would fall over the tent and Moses and, and, and Joshua would go in and they would meet with God. Can you imagine that? I mean, we pray in by faith, and we read by faith, and we have great encounters with God through the Holy Spirit. But could you imagine in, going into a tent and the glory of God so fell that you could visibly see this thick cloud as a representation of God himself? Then all of a sudden, everybody, when they see this, they go in their tents, all the other tribes, they go in their tents, and they stay in their tents, and they talk until, they, until the cloud lifts. The cloud lifts, Moses comes out, but Joshua stays in. There was something in Joshua's heart that he knew if he was ever going to do and be what God had had for him to be, he had to know the God he was going to serve. Family, I'm telling you, you cannot learn and really understand the God you serve through someone else's experience. Someone else's testimony is given to inspire but you have to do this yourself. You have to, to, to dive in yourself and begin to learn God yourself and through leadership and guidance. See, he had the leadership of Moses. I don't, I don't know how you see things. I see things very uh, visibly. And I, I just see that Joshua came in with Moses and when he fell and, and all of a sudden, we talked about worship last week. How do we lead someone into worship? You know, I see Joshua coming in with Moses, and all of a sudden Moses falls on his knees in the presence of God. And then Joshua, seeing that, he falls on his knees. And Moses starts saying, Oh, mighty God of heaven and earth. And under his breath, Joshua says, Oh, mighty God of heaven and earth. So that when Moses leaves now, it's Joshua's opportunity. And the thing that's so cool, although there was no cloud to speak of, or nobody else much noticed, the commentator, we know, says he stayed in. A true leader stays in the presence of the Lord way outside of the church service. It's easy to be there when everybody's like, look at Shannon worship. Woo, watch her worship. 
Look at Andrew, boy, he can sure shuck a buck under the name of Jesus. Y'all know what shuck a buck is? That's a holiness term from when you see that. That's a shuck a buck. Bet you ain't seen that in a while, have you? Growing up in the church of God, honey, we, we saw a lot of shucking and bucking, let me tell you. But what really the relationship with God develops is when all that's over. When the only melody you hear is not coming from the stage, but it's the melody of worship from your heart. We forget that, guys. You ever wonder why we get so busy? I'm just going to be very transparent. Two Sundays ago, I'm standing in worship. Now, I've had, y'all know, my septic nightmares and, and everything in school, still trying to do that, and pastor and visit folks. And had a young man and uh, had had a, a, a five bypass, 80 years old, five bypass in Knoxville. And, you know, we're, we're doing everything that we're supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, Sunday morning happens, Apostle. Sunday morning. And our praise team is taken off on a beautiful song. And I am just there worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, the Lord speaks to me and breaks my heart. And reminds me that's the first I had worshiped Him all week. What was I doing? What was so important in my life? that I didn't take the time to at least just say, God, I love you, and spend some time. I'm not saying I didn't read my Bible. That's not what I did. I did my devotion every day. There's a difference in our routine in true worship. Mm, can I say that again? There's a difference in our routine in true worship. Our routine is out of habit. Well, I'm reading my devotion today. Check. Oh, I prayed for... I prayed for James today because he really needs it. See, I mentioned him again. I prayed for this and check. But worship is not about your checklist or to get it done. Praise the Lord. It's about an interaction with the King of Kings just because you're still his daughter and he's still your God. And you're his son and he's still your God. That's it. Because the thing is we have to understand in this point, and I'm going to move forward. I could preach it for a minute. But godly leaders understand the importance. If I'm not having relationship with the one in whom I'm employed, I'm not really on the team. If I'm not in relationship with the one in whom I'm employed, I'm really not on the team. I guarantee you if I could talk to Sister One now and Brother Mark... And not, not to, I, don't want to, I don't want to call names, I don't, but there's been people who you could tell, although they were still doing the position and holding, doing what they could, we know they're not on the team. Something's not right. They don't act the same. They're not as grateful. They're, they're not congenial. They're not easy to get along with anymore. It has to be their way. Where's this come from? Used to, they would say, oh, pastor, you know, I was in the church van or in the ministry van, and we had a flat tire. Hey, here's the ticket. You know, I had to get some air. Two weeks. Can't believe you guys will put me in a van. Leave me out stranded for a tire. I mean, where did that come from? We know exactly. I just touched a real button right there, boy. Thanks, Winnell. I touched a real button right there. But I'm telling you, I can guarantee you, it's not a, it's not a breakdown in the leadership. It's a, in the relationship. It's very noticeable. All right, guys, three. Godly leaders show reverence. Oh, it just led right in here, didn't it? We know in Isaiah, he admonishes that to us that reverence begets wisdom and produces dis, uh, discernment and foresight. That's what Apostle Mark was sharing with you this morning. There's a saying that to whom much is given, much is required. Being a leader should be one greater, should be one even greater. Greater respect and adoration for those who share similar or esteemed roles. We learn how to honor and respect them. And the Bible declares in Proverbs 9 and 10, fear of, the Lord is the, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Wisdom God gives us illuminates discernment and foresight to what others cannot see. We revere our Savior, and He will give us the right people with the right motives to accomplish the right mission. One, let's break this down. Although you're a leader, you still have to honor other leaders. 
I want you to understand, we are, I love Paul's narrative about the body of Christ and how, although the head, you know, the head is, you know, above the, the rest of the body, you still, you, 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 your head needs your arms, I'm just paraphrasing, your arms need your legs and even them little digits and I got to tell you, I've got a guilty pleasure and I watch it and I about throw up, but it's that whole, um, my feet are going to kill me off of the learning channel. That's gross, dude. And I maybe, I mean, I've had foot issues and I guess that's what leaned me into this, you know, Um, but I've watched this and I'm just thanking God, thank you that I have actually, you know, the right amount of toes on each foot and one foot is not cottage cheese and smells like trash um okay i'm going on so anyway (laughs) but but i've been watching but i've been watching all this stuff and and just and the admiration for these people and the thing is is you go i would never do that but then you understand if somebody doesn't do that then people are really going to be hurt and wounded if there wasn't a doctor who went into podiatry there'd be a lot of hurt people if there wasn't gastroenterologists Okay, that's the guy or the gal that goes up your keister. <laughs> I'm, I'm honest. It goes up your keister. Come on, that's it. If they wasn't for them, there'd be a lot of people dying really quick. I want you to realize that person who is leading with you in that fivefold ministry, if you're not their greatest cheerleader, what are you doing? Do you get some accolade by being able to come to, to come to Apostle Mark and say, look here what our team did. Now, we're better than those jokers, but here you go. <laughs> Boy, he's glad he hired us. I'm glad. And all we're doing, you're just making a butt of yourself. And if you don't have everybody else in line, what are you doing? We're falling right back in the same old patterns that we did before we came to Christ. Before we came to Christ, it's me, me, me. I'm going to succeed. And I'm going to, if I've got to step on your head, I'll step on your head to get what I want. Listen, just because you speak in tongues now doesn't make that right. If that team fails, you're failing too. We've got to understand we're in this together. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I love my Methodist brothers and my Baptist brothers and sisters and those who think a little bit different. There are some that I have a harder time fellowshipping with because either they don't agree with Pentecost or cessationists that believe that all that we feel and experience through Pentecost and the gifts of the Spirit all ended when the apostles rose. I don't find that biblically. I don't care if it is John MacArthur. I don't find that biblically if I, if I really exegete that scripture myself because my Bible says that the promises that we read are for, uh, for your children, your children's children, even as many are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And the book of Acts itself has no ending. If it has no ending, then how can we acclaim that it ends? So anyway, that's my little ministry moment. I also have some that re-identify the Godhead, you know, and salvation by grace through faith is never enough you got to have water involved and you got to speak in tongues or you're never saved i mean there's a lot of heresies that we really can't get into but i'm telling you this if they love jesus and they're preaching jesus and they're seeing souls coming to their their churches i'm not going to be the one going well they're not doing it right i want to be a cheerleader go yay lord Thank you, Jesus, that something's going on. Thank you that they were, they were lost, but now they're found. It's, and it takes a humble pill. We had a young lady. We had a wonderful time. At one of our church families have a, have a big property and have a lot of property. So they, every 4th of July, we go and we have all kinds of food. And uh, then they have water sports. There's a water sport I don't know if you guys are aware of. It's called Soak the Pastor. Uh, or it may just be <laughs> reserved to our church. And what's so funny is every generation takes it up. 20, you know, when I first started, we, well, we started this about five years ago. Our youth, five years ago, that was their number one job for the day. Hey, Brother Stephen. Then it was the garden hose. And then it was a bucket of ice water. And we're relating, because I'm that guy. I don't care. It ain't a big deal. Hey, if nah, whatever. I'm always sloshy when I get out. But I've seen every year, younger kids now are going, Hi, Brother Stephen. You know, it's just... But what we're doing is we're seeing this thing develop. But while we were there, I had a guy, a, a, a guy one of these, uh, another minister who came and led one of our young ladies who, man, she needs Jesus. But she would come into the church and she would sit there and look at you and not pay attention. And, you know, as a pastor, you can't just go back and, 
get in her face or nothing like that, couldn't do that. And then she lives with a drug-addicted dad and a drug-addicted mom, and so she comes very sporadically, but thank God that day she listened to this man and, and got saved. Now, I will tell you that I, <laughs> this guy's something else. I love when folks move to the area and uh, God calls them to the area just to tell all the other ministries how wrong they are and how they're not doing it right. You know, that we should be doing church differently as they did from the state in which they left. That's a little tough pill to swallow because you know what? I mean, come on, been at this too. Um, but God used it. And I, the thing is, guys, I'm not going to belittle that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to encourage that and challenge her to just continue because guess what? It don't matter who reeled in the lure. She come to Jesus. So that's what I'm saying, guys. And I do ask you to pray in your prayer as leaders. Pray one for another. And if you're a strong leader, and I know Apostle Mark and Apostle Winnell, they know who you are. I know you. I love all y'all, but they know the one who's really the leader's leaders. If that's you, ask Apostle about coming alongside one of the leaders that may be struggling and see if you can help them. Would that be in line? Would that be in line of saying, hey, I heard that, that this particular team is not doing well. Maybe there's something. Not to take over. That's not what I'm saying. Somebody, oh, they're going to come and take it over. No. I'm saying come over and put an arm around you and say, hey, man, what's going on? Can I help you? Man, I'd like to help you with this. Uh, there's people in my life that do it. I've got pastor friends who do great things, and they're like, Stephen, what can I do for you? I've got a pastor friend of mine out of Clarksville who in 2019, before COVID, was pastoring the fastest growing church in America. And I have him on my phone. And he's the guy that I can literally call, and when he can, he will call me back. Hey, Stephen, what's up? What can I do for you? What can I resource you with? There was a time a few years ago I was preaching a sermon series on the gifts of the Spirit. And listen, I love to study, but I'm not going to reinvent the wheel if it's already rolling. He did an incredible sermon series, and you know what I did? I said, hey, Mike, would you send me that, the notes on your sermon series? I'd like to include some of that. You know what he did? Talked to his secretary. Within a day, I had all his notes. All I'm saying is, as leaders, we also have to understand we're interdependent one on another. And we need each other. And I, if I can help you, I want to help you. But I also want to be humble enough to know, hey, maybe God's going to send you in my life to help me do some things better. I want you to know when I sit over there for the 10 minutes that I sit, I'm gleaning because Apostle Mark has done things in ministry I've never done. He and Winnell has left ministries and started ministries and saw things succeed. And to me, I'll be honest with you, one of the things that I'm gleaning from today and that I've loved so much is to hear that Mark questioned himself. Because I remember the days when Mark calls me and he goes, okay, Stephen, said, you know, Lord said, we're going to start something new and we're going to leave, you know, Teen Challenge. And I don't think I said no, but in my heart, I'm like, why? You know, he was the director there. They were rocking it. They were built, they were buying new, uh, they were buying new buildings. They were painting new buildings. They had intakes. They were doing things. It was incredible. I went there and I'd seen this evolve from these little things to these now greater ministries and all I'm going, I don't see it. But the thing is, I didn't have to. But I hope he knew that I'm going, Lord God, I don't know what you're doing, but I know it's going to be great. And then we saw the next ministry go, boom. And then as he said, that grace on that ministry for you guys may have shifted a little bit because you decided to take, and I'm not trying to pick, but you decided to take a road of integrity and biblical authority. And, and I know God's going to continue to bless. But if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always had. Amen? But it takes a whole lot of courage. And I admire you. admire you both for going, okay, God, let's do something else. And those of you that have followed along the way, man, you guys are rock stars. All right, let's go on. Four godly leaders stand up for the marginalized. Unfortunately, we live in a society where many have the dog-eat-dog -dog mentality, and I, I mentioned that about leadership. Man, I'm just... You know what, and I'm going to be, and I'm, I don't know if you'll relate with this, and Apostle, correct me, you, you, I don't know if this is relatable for, for this ministry. I'm sorry. Oh, sure can. Godly leaders stand up for the marginalized. <clears throat> marginalized. Those who are set back, put off, belittled. <clears throat> I used to... Hmm? 
could say underdogs, but underdogs is not, I think of underdog the superhero. I'm just talking about the one who come in, nobody thinks they can do the job. The one nobody, th I mean, uh, have you ever heard this, this, this one? Oh, they're on your team. Bless your heart. Oh, they're doing what? Well, ble that condescending, well, bless their heart. Can I tell you the thing I hated, and this is the illustration I'm going to give you. I used to hate going to district councils and minister meetings because at one time we had that era of this. Well, hello, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Now, how much your church running? Well, that's one. What did you do in missions last year? <laughs> well, we got this award, and I don't know what you're doing. And <laughs> We're great. How are you? I hated that. God didn't put us in a metro uh, metropolis area or metropolitan area. We don't get Dollywood. Come on, somebody. Our claim to fame is Omni Mill, and it's a broke-down antique building, but they serve really good food. You don't come to Rogersville by accident. You intend to be there. But again, guys, I hated those ministry meetings because they would just, all right, hey, look what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, man, we can't do it. We don't have your budget. You know, we have one hired staff, and the rest are volunteers. Sometimes leading a volunteer staff is trying to nail jello to the wall. It'll stick for a minute, but if you close your eyes, it's flopping to the floor. Because you know about a volunteer ministry? Is you have to re-enlist again and again and again and again. But again, those were those moments that, man, they just broke my heart. But I'm thankful to see a shift I have seen within leadership. But what that did for me is it makes me be that guy that when I do see that church that may be running 10 people, and they're out there. You see them if you go to these churches. And you know what I found? The passion for God in the 10-member church is just as strong as the one in the 10,000. But unfortunately, we live in a society where the 10,000 gets, gets all the accolade and the attaboys, and we can't wait to get there. And then the little church that gets the well bless their hearts. It's the little church where you have a family that comes in, and they have four kids, and you're struggling just to have something, and all of a sudden you have a youth group, and all of a sudden all the men look at you and say, well, we're going to the bigger church because you know what? They have something for your, our kids. I understand it, but could it possibly be that God is calling them to lead, but they're just so used to consuming that they won't step out and lead something? It's always easier to jump on the back of something that's already moving than it is to get it started yourself. All I'm saying is this, guys, be the God who, who encourages the marginalized. And I challenge you as leaders, you're going to go into, you wouldn't be impressed with Crossroads, we're doing our best, but you know what, you're going to go into churches and the carpet's not going to match and this kitchen's going to be so simple and maybe all they have is about five little ladies or gentlemen who are there who wanted you to come and, and, and speak in their church or stand in their business. Can you please do this as unto the Lord? I don't care what they're doing. You be thankful for being there. You be thankful for what they're doing because guess what? You may be standing in line. You know those rewards in heaven that you talked about, those crowns? You may belittle them now, but they may be the one that's held on to Jesus and all of a sudden you're standing in line and they get so many crowns you have to go help them carry. Amen. Remember, there's no small ministries. If God's called you to it, that's the biggest ministry of your life. Amen? Five, godly leaders' voice should carry authority. Carry authority, not demand authority. Well, don't you know who I am? I want you to know, here's my name tag. Apostle Mark gave me this name tag. And I am the lieutenant of something. <laughs> yeah. Respect me! Come on now. And I know authority does demand respect, but again, it should carry and not just demand. We understand the scripture says this, that he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall slay the wicked. The godly leader speaks and understands that the voice and the speech are governed and controlled by the Holy Spirit. He or she may be used to encourage, admonish, rebuke the actions of another's life. This responsibility should not be taken lightly. Remember, you're there to build not destroy. How many of y'all, I, I ask you every time, and I'm so sorry, I know you do, and I know some others do some building and things like that. 
You know the difference between someone who knows material and doesn't? They know how far to sand and when to stop. They know how far to cut and when to stop. You can take a beautiful, now I guess in this era, $8 two before, and you put it in the wrong hands who don't know its value, and they'll make it into a number two pencil good for nothing. Now I'm not saying you can get it from Lowe's and put it on the house, but all I am saying is you got to know when to cut and when to leave alone. Good, authoritative folks also know when to correct, how to correct, and how much correction is needed. It's that whole parental thing. Listen, I hate to bust your bubble. You're not perfect yet. I hate to, sorry, sorry, Andrew, sorry, I hate to tell you. I'm not either. And guess what? He's still working on me. And you know those prayer times I'm telling you about? Sometimes those are those sanding moments. Lord, I thank you. Well, Stephen, you should be. You need to be. I've called you to. You're just, I, this is the thing the Lord gives me sometimes. You're just going through the motions. Because well, I'm guilty. I'm busy. I'm doing. But sometimes my heart ain't in it like it should be. And I recall what I was when I didn't have any education but a whole lot of enthusiasm. And can I be honest? There's times I miss that guy. He didn't measure three times and speak once. Although I know the journey that God has brought me on is the right journey. I know what I'm doing is what God's called me to do. But still, if I'm not careful, I lose that, en that enthusiasm and direction because of all the other stuff. I think that there were days that Moses forgot that he had been delivered from the bondage of Egypt himself and all he felt was the pressure of leadership. I believe there were days that he could not be thankful that his, how God orchestrated that although all the two-year-old children and below sons were being slaughtered, he was saved. I'm sure there were times. I mean, listen to what he says through the book of Exodus. There were seasons he's done. And I found in my life when I'm done, it's simply because that I've been overtaxed with authority and forget that I'm under authority. Sometimes I forget that where I've been and what God's called me to do. God could have called anybody to do what I do. I was riding with my kids yesterday and thinking, you know what, I get to help people. Yesterday, part of my job was going to a sister's house and helping her load uh, some material. She had had an air conditioning unit back up. And for those of you that are in HVAC, you have to clean those units, don't you? Put a little bleach in those lines. If you don't, it'll gurgle, gurgle, and that water will come floody, floody in your housey, housey. Is that cool? <laughs> you know, if you repeat a word, it, get, it increases its value. You know what I'm saying? Money, money. No, that didn't work. Sorry. But she didn't know that. So all of a sudden, all this water had flooded. So part of my job got to be getting a dolly and loading material and taking it from her soaked basement and putting it in her secure outbuilding. And in that moment, it wasn't about preaching the sermon. It was about living the sermon. It wasn't about just what, what are we doing and what are this ministry. It was just about a brother helping a sister. And family, I wanted you to know that's the purest form of ministry. You have authority, but you're under authority. Your actions speak louder than your words. And I'm going to share this and we're going to go forward. I've got to close. But always know this, when you're under authority... What you do and how you act, you don't just speak for yourself, you speak for the organization who gave you that authority. No matter what you're doing, when you step out of here and you have your team, you may not have these big signs that say, Life Changers Outreach, we're sitting on the hill, Lee Greenwood Parkway, but you know what, that's what you're saying. The way you're talking to the folks on the job, they're either going to want to send their broken people or they're going to say, Dad, gum, I wouldn't send my people there. Listen, I don't mind bad press. That don't, I mean, the Lord overcomes that every day. But real news, come on. I'm not upset if you're lying on me. I mean, it hurts my feelings. But I know if I stand, it'll all come out in the wash. But if I'm really doing that stuff and I'm, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm saying and hurting people under, because I've got some authority, 
Come on now. I know as a pastor, I'll either lead people to Jesus or I'll stop them from coming. And the thing is, the Lord never allows the potential saints of God to come when I'm at my best. They normally are around me when somebody's just cut me off in traffic. Or I'm in Walmart and bless the Lord, hallelujah. I have to pick my own groceries and check it out myself and still pay an arm and a leg. Come on, somebody. But that's where we got to lead, folks. All right, let me cl close with this. Six, godly leaders allow God to keep them centered and balanced. That goes back to that Joshua illustration of him staying in the tent. And I know what you're saying, but pastor, I can't, my mornings are so busy, I can't spend 20 hours in the tent with the Lord. You're not supposed to. We read that Jesus spent time in the wilderness and he spent time here, but he also went back and f finished, the, finished the, the calling, the challenge. I want you to know, I'm, uh, five minutes of intentional praise and worship is a whole lot better than 50 minutes of lollygagging around. It don't take you all morning long just to touch Jesus. Oh, you know what my Bible tells me, Apostle? That when I speak his name, if I'm married and I lean over there and I grab sweetheart's hand and I say, let's just pray for a minute, and I mention his name, he's in the midst. It don't take prompting, prodding, invoking. Come on now. And sometimes God understands too, but that intentional moment, God, you know my day is going to be crazy. I'm going to have to deal with Andrew, and God, I need your anointing. No, see it. <laughs> but the thing is, is, that's intentional. And then when you can have those beautiful times, then take advantage of it. But always remember that family of faith. Godly leaders allow God to keep them centered and balanced. We understand, too, that having a righteous mind allows, allows a leader to concentrate on what matters most in life and are able to lead effectively. You can't be a godly leader without God. It's impossible. You'll get greedy. You'll get arrogant. You'll get snotty. Come on now. We already said it, and I know when I was mentioning that earlier this morning, you knew three people right there. That's him, Jesus. I'm glad I don't know everything you know. That way when I say this, you know, okay, he has no clue, so he's just preaching from the Lord. But again, it takes God to keep us centered and understand that when all things are said and done, we'll stand before he who has called us and give an account for this calling. You preach that, Apostle? Yes, sir. And I just want to hear him say, well done, not I'm glad you're done. <laughs> yeah, I want, I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful. Now, whoo, I couldn't let you live no more. You're just fixing to tear it up. I don't want to be that guy. I mean, don't get me wrong. I pray, and my prayer is to live to about 99, and then about a 99 and a half, the trump of God sounds, and we're out of here. My plan is to see the grandbabies and great-grandbabies and all that. I mean, ain't that your plan, too? That's sort of what we're hoping for. But the thing is, too, is I don't want to outlive the anointing of God on my life. I don't want to end my life making such a mistake that the years and years of ministry that I've done for Jesus is tarnished because of something stupid. And I'm not saying God's going to take you out. That's not how he does it. If he did, there'd be a lot of ministries taken out. That's all I'm saying. But all I'm saying is this, family of faith. I want you to know that God leaders allow, godly leaders allow God to keep them centered and balanced. All right, that's 10 o'clock. I just want you to know, guys, you're not called here by accident. I, somebody's got to get that this morning. Because I'm sure, if, especially we've got some new faces in here, and I don't know about you, but there's still times I'll look in the mirror and I go, now, God, are you sure? You, I'm a goofball. I say stupid stuff. But I'm so thankful that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. We can go through all of our patriarchs, Abraham, all the way in through the New Testament and find something that they did that they shouldn't have done. But at the same time, God saw more in them. God saw more potential than he saw problem. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. 
And a person who's been broken can help somebody else be fixed. And if we understand and we keep humility because we know we're one stupid mistake away from Apostle putting his arm around us and saying, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. You know? <laughs> Sorry, was that too far? I hope it went too far. But anyway, but I want you to know God loves you. You're chosen, and what you do today is going to make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives, both here and every center around the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today for your goodness and your graciousness. Thank you, God, for what Apostle Mark has shared earlier and what you allowed me to share a minute ago. I pray we're encouraged and fired up. I pray, oh God, that, that heaven is excited and hell is afraid of what we're fixing to do today. I pray, oh Lord, that you would empower us, that you would continue, God, to use us and walk through us. And let us be men and women of faith, knowing that only what's done in faith and through faith, it will be the thing that endures. So God, I thank you and I praise you and I give you all honor and glory. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Can we all say? Amen. I love you all.